Hello, fellow gardeners. Uh, my name is Mike Hager, and I am the former board chair of the Minnesota State Horticultural Society. Unfortunately, we're going to miss seeing uh, most of you again at the Home and Garden Show this year, uh, but uh, it will be back again in person in March of 2022. So you will obviously hear more about that as time goes on. Um, I do want to spend a little bit of time here before we get into the topic at hand, just to talk a little bit about the Horticultural Society and uh, give you kind of an update um, on some things relative to that. Obviously, uh, we've kind of revamped and revisited our both our vision and mission statement here in recent times and i just did kind of wanted to share that with you uh i think the society is going through some exciting exciting changes and going in uh some new directions that i think are really positive for uh for the long-term success of the society and uh, you'll be hearing lots and lots more about that from staff um, in, in upcoming times, uh, we're just kind of re looking at a, a strategic planning initiative and some other things right now. So I, I find it's a very exciting time and I just wanted to share with you some of what's going on there uh, and uh, lots and lots and lots of great things. So um, since the 2021 Home and Garden Show is not an in-person event, um, all the plant material that traditionally has been sold as part of that event obviously can't occur in person this year. So uh, staff has transitioned that, uh, sale that plant material over into an online format. So there is an, uh, an online uh, uh, store on the Hort Society's website where you can take a look at these plants, read about them, and hopefully order a whole bunch of them and, and help us uh, generate some revenue off of these, even though we can't do it in person. So if you go to www.northerngardener.org, you can find all that information on the site there. So, so please do have a look and uh, try to uh, help the society out by purchasing some of these materials. I'm here today to talk a little bit of uh, with you about bulbs. And uh, um, the bulbs, are, the information I'm going to share with you today on bulbs is a little bit more oriented towards uh, uh, spring flowering bulbs, bulbs that come into flower at really at this time of year and continue on into spring. Um, I will say that a, a fair no amount of the plant material that's available in the online store is a little bit more oriented towards summer flowering bulbs. And really the big difference uh, for you to keep in mind relative to, to that is that uh, a number of the summer flowering bulbs you're gonna find on that website like dahlias and, and uh, calla lilies um, and some other things like that are not winter hardy in the ground out of doors here in Minnesota. So uh, they're great for adding summer color, but they're either gonna have to be lifted and stored indoors or you simply treat them as an annual and replant them every year. Now that's not to say there are no summer flowering bulbs that are winter hardy. There's a fair selection of lilies in the online store. And of course, those are absolutely winter hardy for us here as well. So, so uh, be careful, read all the information about them. Um, and I think that will help guide you through the process. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go ahead and talk a little bit in general about bulbs. And uh, we use that term bulbs really very, very loosely. And if you look carefully uh, at, at plant structures, uh, actually there's a whole bunch of different uh, root or, or storage type organs that technically are not truly bulbs, but for simplicity's sake, we just tend to call them all bulbs. Um, I'm not really gonna get into that in any significant way today. Suffice it to, stay, to say for your purposes here, it's important to understand uh, what, bulb, what a bulb is. And bulb is, a bulb is really a storage organ and uh, it stores food. And for the reason why some plants, and we typically call plants that have this kind of uh, behavior, we, uh, in addition to calling them bulbs, we can also call them geophytes. Uh, those plants have evolved in parts of the world where uh, growing conditions are pretty harsh. And it could be, it could be the deserts of uh, Turkey. It could be really high alpine situations. And that food storage organ that we call a bulb is vital to that plant survival in its native situation. So. Um, 
a lot of people, I think, tend to think of bulbs as roots, uh, root tissue, but they're really not. They are stem tissue, and they do grow roots out from them as well. So uh, you can do a little bit of homework on your own and, and see which which bulbs or which what we call bulbs are truly bulbs, which are corms, which are tubers, et cetera, et cetera, because we just really don't have time to do that here today. So as I say, I'm going to spend the balance of my time with you here today, just going through and sharing some images and some thoughts relative to some of, of, uh, of spring flowering bulbs for us here uh, in the in the upper Midwest. And honestly, if I had to pick, um, if I had to pick just one type of bulb to grow, it would be hands down, it would be uh, daffodils. In terms of spring flowering bulbs, they are the most permanent, uh, the most long lived and the toughest of all of the bulbs. And uh, there are literally thousands of varieties. And this is just a planting uh, showing some uh, uh, more, a more, if we would call it naturalized type of planting of daffodils using uh, three or four different varieties here, two yellows uh, and, uh, and, and a white with that uh, uh, reddish throat, that uh, reddish orange throat that you can see there as well. So uh, daffodils are a really, really large group of plants and uh, they've actually been divvied up into a number of classifications primarily based upon the uh, origin, the species used in their breeding backgrounds and or the length of the cup. Uh, in this image here, you see that reddish orange cup up front there in the bottom. Uh, that's called the Krupp cup or the corona on a daffodil. And the length of that uh, cup or corona in relative to the width of the rest of the flower plays a plays a role in classification as well. And I really am not going to, uh, we again, don't have time to get into that in any significant way, but it's important for you to understand as you look through gardening catalogs and read about daffodils and stuff, you're going to hear uh, things like uh, trumpet-shaped, uh, large cupped, small cupped, uh, Cyclamenius, John Quills, uh, all those kinds of names. Those are relative to, uh, to this classification system. So uh, I just think it's important for you to have a little bit of knowledge relative to uh, to that. Um, just going to share a few varieties here with you um, um, and some of the really, really good ones. And it's really just a handful of them here. But I'm going to show you a little bit of the representation of the of how some of these flowers will look, look a little bit more close up. This is a, an oldie but a goodie. It's been around for a long time. Still a great daffodil. And it's one that's commonly sold. It's one called Ice Follies. And Ice Follies is what we call a, a large cupped type daffodil. So it's a, what we call a division two daffodil. So the, the, the cup is not, uh, it's kind of intermediate in size between the big trumpet forms and the really, really small cup forms. And you can see the wonderful coloration that, that we see um, um, in this one. It's, it's uh, uh, both one pr pr primarily exclusively almost white or near white in coloration on ice follies. Really, really good all around daffodil to have in the landscape as well. Let's put this one in because it kind of shows that something a little bit different. This is again a, a large cup and this shows you taken from the sides to get an idea from what the length of that corona or cup is on this one. And this is, is the one that has white outer segments and that uh, kind of uh, pinkish, reddish pink cup on it and uh, these are wonderful and they're really different and a lot of people don't know them very well that coloration that cup coloration in this these types of daffodils really uh, the intensity of the coloration is really dependent upon weather patterns and if we have cool moist spring during daffodil bloom season which of course for us is usually uh, peak time is usually about the second week of May here uh, we get really good intense uh, uh, and uh, development of the color and it holds pretty well. If we go into a really hot uh, period during that same uh, you know, bloom time, we probably won't see the, the richness of color that you see in this particular one. This happens to be one that I forced a couple years ago in a pot at home. So uh, this is actually a, an Im image taken inside. So it just shows you a, a, a little bit of the range of color. And this, this is a, another real good standard old variety. It's one called Merlin. And uh, this is one of the uh, short cupped 
types, but shows you what a big uh, big clump of this uh, can look like in the garden. And honestly, this is this image I took in my landscape probably two or three years ago, and these bulbs were probably planted in 2015. So this isn't a real old clump, but look at the amount of flower production on it as well. And here, interplanted into it, you see a little bit of hints of blue down in there. There's another spring, uh, another spring flowering uh, bulb that we'll come back to in just a second uh, as we go through this. It's one of the grape hyacinths. And you can do some fun things like this, kind of interplant. You can do this with either spring flowering bulbs or summer flowering bulbs, interplant uh, other bulbs with them, interplant annuals into them or among them, or you know, uh, you can do some really fun and interesting kinds of combinations. So uh, I think this just shows you a close up of Merlin. Again, you can see how much more reduced that cup is. And this particular one has, uh, actually in the cup has two different shades of yellow and then that red rim on it. And again, that reddish rim uh, can vary again in intensity depending upon what, what weather patterns are. So uh, it's, it's uh, really a fine, fine old variety as well. Here's a, an image showing uh, one of the uh, uh, smaller uh, type daffodils, one called the uh, minnow uh, that you see there on the left side interplanted with some grape hyacinth, grape hyacinths and a great spring flowering perennial that uh, has grown quite commonly here. Uh, Brunneros, uh, sometimes called false forget-me-not. Uh, this happens obviously to be a variegated foliage form of it, which is kind of fun because it kind of the white variegation on the foliage of the Brunnera actually picks up on uh, both, both the white of the grape hyacinth that you see there and the white outer segments of the particular daffodil. So I think the use of some of these plants with some of our other early spring flowering perennials is absolutely wonderful to have in the landscape and really uh, putting them together into these kind of little vignettes really makes, gives it some power and, some, and uh, uh, really kind of helps, helps make the show even greater. Here's one called Bell Song, interplanted uh, or, or planted, if you will, behind a clump of host. And this is actually kind of a, a good trick to remember with a lot of spring flowering bulbs who come up early, uh, foliage emerges early, daffodils are, I have daffodils that are three, four inches out of the ground right now. Uh, but you have to remember that with most of these spring flowering bulbs that they emerge early, they flower, and they do go dormant in the summer months. So that makes it a little bit more tricky in terms of placing them in the landscape. Whereas with a lot of the summer flowering bulbs, we have persistent foliage that's there uh, really through the whole season. So one of the tricks to hide or to mask mask some of the dying foliage of, da of uh, things like daffodils and tulips is to interplant them into other clumps of perennials or has been done here, plant them behind. So as the hosta foliage emerges and develops, it actually tends to cover over the dying foliage of the daffodil. So, so a little bit more thought, I think, maybe has to go into placement uh, with, uh, with, with some of these spring flowering bulbs and we would with uh, some of our other perennials that are persistent foliage-wise through the whole summer. So, so as I say, with daffodils, my favorite hands down, at, culturally, the, these spring flowering bulbs that we're talking about here today are all planted in the fall for the following spring. And out of all of that spring flowering bulbs that we can plant in fall, daffodils are the ones that are most important to get into the ground first, earliest, if you will, because they have the longest rooting period in the fall of the year. In an ideal world, we'd have all of our daffodils, our newly planted daffodils in the ground by late September, early October. They need four to six weeks of rooting time. If they don't get enough rooting time, um, they sometimes will not survive the winter. Once established, that's not an issue. But with uh, planting spring flowering bulbs, daffodils are the first ones that should go on the ground in the fall of the year. So do keep that in mind as well. Of course, everybody loves tulips, including the deer and the rabbits, unfortunately, as well. This is just uh, a combination of a number of years ago uh, in, at the entry to the Snyder Building at the uh, Landscape Arboretum. Uh, Happy Family, Silhouette Bouquet, Sunshine Club, these are the varieties involved here and actually interplanted with some uh, cool season annuals, kind of weaving and wandering in between them. Another great way to use these. And uh, this tends to be a lot of gardeners' favorites are tulips because there's such a wide array of colors 
uh, and forms and types available. Again, there's a classification system for, there's like 14 different divisions of tulips that you can draw up of. So uh, lots and lots of huge wealth of plant material for you to work from and to include in the landscape again as well. Uh, thing you uh, have to remember with tulips, is that they will not offer the permanence and longevity of a daffodil. Uh, they may give you a few years and then they may dwindle and go away. And that will be uh, especially the case if they're interplanted in situations where they get a lot of summer irrigation. Understand once again that all those spring flowering bulbs that go dormant in the summer really like to be on the dry side in their dormant period. Uh, they they do not like a lot of moisture around the bulbs that we can uh, run into rot issues, uh, disease and rot issues with if we have too much of that. And that's one of the reasons why many tulips tend to be fairly short-term plants. You know, honestly, uh, for what you can buy a tulip bulb for, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I'd get my two to three years out of them and I'll just replant. Um, you know, uh, occasionally you'll find them that will live much longer if the situation is just right. But certainly, as I said, they're not they don't offer the same level of permanence that a daffodil will offer to you in the landscape. So um, here's just uh, one inner plant, again, planted, interplanted with another clump of perennials. This is actually uh, a Japanese woodland plant in the background there called the yellow wax bells that blooms for us in August and September. So this little vignette here, we have the bulbs that come early in spring. And then we have a, a perennial that comes in and gives us a show later in the season. Again, kind of fun to not only combine some of these bulbs like tulips with things that bloom at the same time, like we saw in the previous slide where the you know, cool season annuals were interplanted with them, but also uh, they can be handled in this way to give us spring color and a portion of the landscape and let something else come in in summer or something else come in in fall uh, to kind of fill that void as well. So uh, so uh, this again, show you just uh, idea of the range of coloration and patterns and stuff that's available within them. If you're looking for permanence and longevity in tulips, I would encourage you to look at what we tend to call the botanicals, uh, the species types and the varieties that are cl closely derived from species tulips. They are much, much more permanent in the landscape. And this is one of those. This is uh, 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 a variety called Salmon Gem that in flower is probably no more than six inches tall. These tend to bloom uh, a little bit earlier than the standard tulip varieties do. So, you know, again, those standard tulip varieties are May for us. I'll have some of these in flower in late April, late April, early May is kind of the uh, uh, kind of the real peak period of time for these near these botanical type tulips as well. And there's a, a lot of really interesting, fun ones for you to, to experiment and to play with in this group. So if you've never gardened with any of these, I would encourage you to, to, uh, to try them. Certainly, as I say, they're going to give you, I think plants are going to last much longer in the landscape um, than, uh, than some of the, the large modern hybrid forms are. I love to use tulips this way. And uh, I force probably somewhere in the range of 50 to 75 containers uh, every year that uh, uh, I use, uh, that actually we use at the uh, uh, entryway to our home in spring to give uh, kind, of, kind of initial spring greeting. And uh, so I treat these strictly as annuals here. It's, it's, I don't remember off the top of my head which variety this is. I should, but I can't. Uh, just a couple of pots of uh, large pots planted with grape hyacinths and tulips together. And I love to use them this way. And uh, that way I don't even have to worry about trying to replace them in the landscape. I use them in containers to give me that show of color in spring. So um, that's another way to, to approach that whole thing as well. So lots and lots of fun things you can do there. Here's one, this one's called Bud Light uh, in this particular pot here. Um, I have the luxury of a 40 degree garage in the winter time so I can put all these inside so that, you know, uh, and hold them inside in cool temperatures, get them rooted in and then bring them out in early spring. In fact, here we are today, what, March 18th or 19th, whatever we are today, and I actually have all my pots outside already because they want to grow so bad. So, so uh, lots of great things you can do with them as well. A couple others, a few others for us to look at here. 
that are important in the spring landscape. These, are, of course, are hyacinths. This is one called Delft Blue. Uh, gardeners love these for the wonderful, wonderful fragrance that they bring to the spring landscape. Uh, I'll be very frank and honest with you. Uh, I think I look on hyacinths kind of the same way I look on tulips, not as a real permanent long lived plant. And again, that's going to be especially true in those soils that stay too moist in the summertime. Um, again, understand that all these plants, like these tulips and these hyacinths, have originated from areas like Iran, Iraq, Turkey, where the summers are oppressively hot and dry, and they love those kinds of situations. So, but again, would that deter me from including and growing uh, hyacinth in in the garden, either in a garden or in a container? Absolutely not, because they give us such a nice show, and there's a whole range of colors. Uh, available in these as well. But again, not uh, not something I ex expect to plant, say, in fall this year and to be with me five, 10 years down the line, I'll probably end up having to replace it. And as I say, whole array of colors and stuff for you to work from, uh, from and with on, on this group as well. Uh, some lesser known kinds of things that sometimes get lumped together and called minor bulbs or dwarf bulbs. Uh, High uh, uh, snowdrops, and this is uh, uh, Galanthus elwesii, which is actually in flower in my garden today. And if you get, you can get hooked on these things, there are hundreds and hundreds of different varieties of snowdrops. And they get that name snowdrop because they occur at high elevations in the mountains, and they tend to actually many times they tend to bloom. Uh, start to bloom when there's still snow around them. And actually, uh, some in my garden still do have a little bit of snow around them as they are in flower today. And these are very dwarf, very early, one of the earliest bulbs for us to bloom in the spring of the year. Most gardeners look forward to these uh, as kind of one of the first signs of spring. They feel spring is really here when, when some of the snowdrops have come into flower. They're, they come early. They give their show and they go dormant very quickly thereafter. And that's true from a, for a lot of these dwarf little bulbs that we're gonna look at here uh, in the next few images. So, so these are great for, for adding that really early season color. Uh, most gardeners know crocus. This is crocus varanus, one called flower record. And there are, as I say, a number of different varieties available in these as well. And it, these are uh, some of the uh, more species, uh, more species type of, of the crocus. And uh, actually, uh, we've got uh, we've utilized these in in our garden to uh, create a crocus lawn. And so, actually, again, in flower right now in our in our crocus lawn at our home here is we have a number of different crocuses blooming as well. So again, since they emerge early, they flower early, they go dormant quickly, they work pretty well for putting into those kind of situations, interplanted in lawn or interplanted into ground cover plantings or some of those kind of things. And again, it's one of those bulbs that most gardeners look to uh, as, as you know one of the very, very first signs of spring. The large flowered crocus hybrids that are more commonly sold are a little bit later to flower than more species types such as the one you see here are a little bit earlier. So you can push the the bloom season quite uh, quite quite over a number of period of a number of weeks by selecting varieties properly. Here a picture of uh, some of those crocus in our crocus lawn as they're emerging and coming up at this time of year so um and uh so you could we, we need to do more of this kind of thing we don't do a whole lot of this in the midwest to interplant some of these things in these kind of situations they just add such a wonderful spring element to the landscape as well a um, couple others to look at um this is one called uh, pushkinia uh, which I th actually think has gone through a name change and is now lumped as, as one of the squills or scillas. Um, love this plant. Again, it, it's uh, a fairly, uh, uh, I won't want to say, use the word aggressive, but a generous self-seeder. Uh, we have it uh, in mass growing uh, in a shady portion of our garden where in spring it's uh, it's just this huge carpet of these wonderful uh, kind of white flowers with uh, these blue streaks in them as well. Again, very short, probably only four, six inches tall in flower. Um, 
I just simply would never be without it. It's such a such a great great plant. And but I understand I if you're nervous about that. I've got seedlings in my lawn and some other things. It's not as bad as the blue flowered Siberian squill, which I probably would not recommend you. Uh, but it's such a wonderful showy plant. Uh, I I love it. I think it's another one of those er, nice early spring minor bulbs. This is. Uh, uh, Kiana Doxa, uh, again, another one that's gone through a name change. The common name on this plant is Glory of the Snow. And obviously, uh, occurs native in the high alpine regions uh, in Europe. And it's not uncommon to see this, again, thing blooming still as the snow is melting and going away. Again, very early, not quite as early as the Pushkinia and the Crocus, but coming very shortly thereafter that for us here. Um, there are a number of different forms of this or pure white flowered forms. There's a pink form of, of this plant as well. Here again, taking that trick of kind of carefully planting where this goes so that as the foliage is going dormant and going away, that the foliage of this epimedium or barren wort that you see in the background here kind of canopies over and kind of hides that and masses it and goes away. So. Uh, you know, this is, uh, as I said, there's so, so many fun things uh, that we can do to bring that really early season color into, into the landscape as well. We talked about grape hyacinths earlier. Uh, here's a, a clump of grape hyacinths. This particular variety is called Superstar. Uh, large flowers born in great perfusion here uh, combined with actually then the white in the background is the double flowered trillium. Uh, a double flowered form of our native trillium grandiflorum uh, as well. And a lot of sometimes grape hyacinths, they're kind of funny. Sometimes they'll throw foliage in the fall of the year. That foliage will then overwinter and, uh, and uh, the blooms will come up in spring. Typically, this, this we're getting more towards the month of May as we look to, for, to bloom on these. Uh, sometimes they don't send their foliage up till spring. So they're kind of... Uh, uh, kind of erratic about that, but if the foliage does come up and fall, it's not a problem. It overwinters uh, and it and it does just fine. So, um, so again, lots and lots of different ones: blue ones, white ones, pink ones. Uh, interesting bicolored forms of grape hyacinths as well. And in addition to being great garden plants, as you can see here, they also force beautifully in the container uh, for early spring color as well. So. And then uh, just a couple others as as we uh, kind of wrap this up here. Uh, this is uh, Allium giganteum, one of a large number of uh, uh, great ornamental onions that we can grow here. And uh, the spring flowering forms of ornamental onions, such as this one, tend to uh, uh, come up quite early to flower uh, and then to go dormant very, very shortly thereafter flowered. In fact, a lot of times when this particular one is blooming in the garden, the foliage is already senescent and not looking so great. And here, so here's the trick that's been done here is to use that hardy cranes bill, uh, one variety called wargrave pink. This is this wargrave pink is the name of this cranes bill um, to interplant the bulbs into that mass of the cranes bill. And you don't even really, basically don't even see the senescent foliage of this onion. And then you get these wonderful large uh, domed heads of, of, of uh, flowers that come out of this. This is again, a very, there's like 600 and some species of onions worldwide, distributed worldwide. So this is a big group of plants. And so they aren't all tall, large flowered, uh, large headed flowers like you see here. There are some really short, close to the ground ones that are only inches high to some that can stand five feet high. So there's great diversity to draw up of and to work with in this particular group as well. And again, um, if you struggle to keep them around long-term in the landscape, it's probably because they're being kept too wet in the summer. And of course, the beauty of interplanting into a planting like this is that the roots of the uh, Cranesbill in the summer months tend to uh, suck up most of the moisture. And so by these kind of interplanting techniques, we can minimize the amount of summer moisture uh, uh, on spring flowering bulbs during their dormant period. And I think that you will find will enhance longevity and permanence in the garden as well. So those are some other kinds of tricks I think that we need to keep in mind as well. By the way, uh, there are some really phenomenal summer flowering uh, ornamental onions as well. 
And the difference, of course, with those is that they do keep their foliage through the entire growing season and they look, foliage looks great through the entire growing season. So by carefully selecting ornamental onions for your garden, you could have probably the earliest ones coming uh, in the month of May. And the latest one would be one that would probably be, still be in flower when the killing frost comes in fall. So uh, you could get a whole season of bloom out of, of, out of these all these great ornamental onions by careful varietal selection. So do keep that in mind as well. And then I think the last one that I have to share with you today is uh, Spanish bluebells. Um, this is uh, uh, one, again, that typically flowers for us in the month of May, um, is a great, great kind of colonizer, natural, uh, naturalizer. It doesn't spread by runners or anything, but the, it cl makes clumps and increases quite nicely. Here, it's just simply planted in mass at the base of a variegated foliage uh, dogwood. Um, and so when it's uh, in springtime, when the dogwood foliage is emerging and the and the uh, uh, foliage of the uh, and flowers of the Spanish bluebells are doing their thing. It makes a great little vignette, and we come back to the same thing in summer. What's happened is the, the foliage of the uh, dogwood has canopied out, filled in. The, the foliage of the bluebells has gone away, and it's the shrub that shrub and maybe adjacent plantings to this that carry the the uh, show through the summer months as well. So um, again, so. I keep coming back to that whole idea of kind of carefully thinking things through um, in terms of how you place them and how you utilize them. And I say that's particularly important with some of these spring flowering bulbs. With the summer ones, uh, yeah, you can kind of tuck them in between other clumps of perennials or annuals or whatever, and their foliage is gonna be there. You're not gonna run into that same kind of issue. So if you're talking about the dahlias or the glads, uh, or any of a broad, really wide range kinds of things, uh, they're a little bit a uh, little bit easier to integrate, perhaps, and have them look neat and tidy in the landscape through the summer months. So, so I certainly would encourage you if you uh, haven't tried some of these to uh, uh, to to do so. And uh, I know some of you took advantage last fall for the first time. The Hort Society did do a fall bulb sale, selling some of those. Uh, early spring flowering kinds of, of bulbs for us. And I uh, anticipate that we will do that again in fall. So you will have an opportunity to purchase some of those through that channel. And again, that uh, the society gets a portion of the profits uh, off of that uh, to help its its budget situation, its revenue situation as well. So, so you have the opportunity here with uh, the online store that's active now to purchase some of the summer flowering stuff for your summer landscape here in 2021 and come fall, you have the opportunity to purchase some of these spring flowering bulbs for your spring 2022 landscape. So so with that, uh, I wish you all a great, great gardening season. And uh, it's been a pleasure to spend a little bit of time chatting about these plants with you today.